So the next talk is by Paola Di Matteo, who will talk about uh, bulge properties from a theoretical perspective. So Paola, feel free to share your screen. Yeah, we, we can now see the presentation. But you are muted, I think. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, for uh, organizing and inviting me uh, to give this review talk. Uh, so we will uh, move on the let's say on the complementary side of uh, of, uh, of the bulge studies because uh, in the in the next uh, uh, half an hour we will uh, focus on the Milky Way bulge. And uh, in particular, what I would like to discuss uh, uh, is, the, is the way, in some sense, we, we are building, uh, thanks to a complementarity between uh, numerical models and, uh, and, uh, and uh, observational data, uh, how we are building or rebuilding our view of the central regions of the Milky Way. Um, so first of all, let's start with this. Uh, with this uh, um, uh, artistic view of the Milky Way, but that uh, allows me to, to, to put the, the bulge in its context uh, in uh, relative to the galaxy. So if we look at the, at the left uh, image, uh, we see uh, what the Milky Way will possibly uh, like uh, look like if it could be seen as a phase on galaxy. Uh, we have a bar in the center of, the, of our Milky Way, and we have a, a system of spiral galaxy uh, Departing, uh, the spiral uh, arms departing from, from it. And when we look at the edge on view, we see that in the central regions, we have this bulge that at this moment, for me, it's simply uh, an over density of stars that uh, um, um, distributes also outside the galactic disk. Th this bulge is surrounded by a disk. And in fact, the, the disk, uh, it's in itself a, a, a complex uh, structure, let's say, because we know that it's made of populations of different ages, metallicities, alpha abundance, and kinematics. So what we typically refer to the thin and the thick disk of the Milky Way. And then we have uh, a very smooth and light in terms of mass distribution that is the stellar halo that surrounds uh, the disk and the bulge. And finally, we have all these uh, little systems, uh, more than 150, that are the globular clusters that are typically very old systems that are found both in the halo and in the bulge of our galaxy. So in some sense, what I will uh, try to, to show you later is that to understand uh, the properties uh, of the bulge of the Milky Way, we need really to place it in the context and, uh, and to link it to the surrounding stellar populations. And uh, here I just added uh, a few values about the thin and the thick disk properties in terms of uh, scale length and scale height today. So we have that the thin disk is uh, uh, on average as a scale length that is uh, longer than the one of the thick disk, the alpha and thick disk. And also the scale height of the thick disk is about three times higher than the scale height of the thin disk. Okay, so um, for a long time, uh, the bulge of the Milky Way has been seen as uh, what we would call also, also listening to, to Simon talk as a classical bulge. That is, in some sense, a spheroidal component, an elliptical that happens to have a prominent disk around it. And uh, uh, this is not only a, a matter of nomenclature, but uh, uh, this, this pointed to the, to the idea that the, the, the evolutionary path and the formation path of the uh, bulge of the Milky Way was different from the one of the uh, experienced by the disk. And then uh, at the same time in the, in the early 90s and at the late of the 80s, there have been a number of studies that have um, led us to reconsider uh, and to understand both uh, bulges, some of the bulges in external galaxies and both the bulge of the Milky Way. And here I just want to cite uh, this work, uh, this uh, um, observational work by the Susa and the Sanios on 87, uh, where they showed and studied uh, a number of extragalactic bulges, uh, showing that many of them had, in fact, uh, uh, boxing structures. They didn't look like spheroids, but they had more boxy or peanut uh, 
shape structures. And at, at the same time, uh, we started to have the first numerical simulations showing that uh, um, it was possible to produce a kind of boxy or peanut shape uh, over densities in the central regions of galaxy, um, uh, essentially simply from material uh, um, uh, taken up from the disk. So if in a disk uh, we develop a stellar bar in the central regions, this stellar bar, the central parts of this stellar bar can at some point puff up, thicken, and produce this kind of morphologies. So uh, from, the, from the numerical point of view, we started to understand that there was possibly a link between bars, uh, boxy peanut shaped algaes, and disks. Uh, and so that some of the morphologies that we were uh, finding in, in other galaxies could be related to the disk instead of being related to spheroids. And at the same time, for example, the work of the Suze dos Anjos gave also some uh, um, statistical argument to think that there must have been a relation between these uh, boxy peanut shaped structures observed in external galaxies and bars. And after that, we had uh, decades of, of models, uh, of n-body models, which, has, uh, uh, which have helped us understanding uh, the formation of these structures and uh, uh, what kind of uh, orbits uh, or uh, stellar populations uh, make these structures. And uh, uh, as I was saying, it appeared clear that box and pinot shaped bulges in these galaxies were, in fact, the manifestation of the same phenomenon. A stellar bar, you can see it, for example, in this plot taken from simulation by Martina Valcuesta et al. 2006. You start, uh, uh, we start with a thin disk that is seen age on in this simulation. And as time passes, uh, what you cannot see from here to here is that a bar forms in the central part of this disk. And at some point, uh, this bar goes uh, through some uh, uh, vertical instabilities that leads to this buckling and at the end to form uh, a, a clear uh, peanut uh, X shape. Um, we also understood that the, the, the morphology, the boxy or peanut shape uh, morphology also depends on the bar viewing angle. Uh, for example, uh, if, you, if you look at this plot by, the, by Atanasula uh, 2003, uh, what you see on the top uh, is a face on view of uh, three different simulations of these galaxies with bars. And then on the middle and bottom row, what you see is the, is the um, uh, shape, let's say, of the morphology of, of, of this galaxy seen uh, edge on uh, when uh, the, the observer point of view is perpendicular to the bar minor axis, major axis, and this is the middle row, or to the bar minor axis, and this is the uh, bottom row. Okay. Uh, so we, we were learning this uh, from, from the point of view of n-body models, from the point of view of uh, um, observations of external galaxies, and at the same time, uh, still in the 90s, we started to realize that also uh, the Milky Way bulge had uh, a morphology that was not really spheroidal, and this came essentially from near-infrared and infrared observations of the central regions of our galaxy that started to reveal uh, that also our bulge was indeed boxy. Huh? And, uh, and this was also supporting the early suggestions that the galaxy was barred that were based uh, essentially on the, on the study of, uh, uh, of the gas motions in the disk. Now, after, uh, after many years of work on, on, on this topic, what we, we, um, what we can conclude is that we have then definite evidence that the Milky Way bulge is a boxy uh, peanut shaped bulge. And this makes uh, the, 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 the Milky Way bulge the closest example uh, to study this class of objects that are not rare in, in the local universe. Huh? And uh, uh, for example, according to this work by Ludwig et al. 2000, about 45% of bulges in Asian galaxies uh, has a boxy peanut shape. So understanding our bulge is also important to possibly understand uh, more generally this class of objects. Uh, so the, our current best view uh, of, of the structure of the inner uh, um, regions of the Milky Way uh, has been traced in a, in a, in a number uh, of works uh, by Chris Wegg, uh, uh, Ortwin Gerhardt, uh, and Mathieu Portail in the last years. 
um, we can start uh, looking at the, at the middle panel, uh, which shows you um, the, 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 the distribution of, uh, of stars uh, in the inner regions of, of the galactic disk, uh, the position of the sun is here on the bottom, and you can, um, what uh, Wagen collaborator found is that there is uh, clearly evidence of a, of a stellar bar in the disk of the Milky Way, uh, which has uh, an inclination uh, uh, with respect to the uh, sun galactic center direction of about 27 degrees. And that in the central regions of this bar, this bar has a semi-major axis of about 5 kBc, and in the central regions of this bar, a boxy peanut shape is present. And they, they could, in fact, trace uh, the distribution, the 3D distribution of, of stars in the, in the inner regions of the galaxy by making use of uh, data from the VVB survey and coupling this, uh, uh, this data with uh, dynamical models. So you see uh, 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 clearly uh, uh, a boxy peanut structure in the, in the, in the regions. And, uh, and uh, uh, this is when uh, the, the, the distribution of stars is plotted in a mixed Z direction. But in fact, what we observe uh, in our galaxy, where we look uh, in the bulge direction, is, uh, uh, can be represented in this map on the top, uh, which shows the distribution of stars in longitude latitude at this time. And you can see uh, an apparent uh, um, asymmetry uh, between uh, in the bulge at positive and, log and, and negative lo uh, longitudes, that in fact it's simply a manifestation of the fact that the bar has uh, uh, an inclination uh, with respect to the to the sun uh, galactic center direction. So these stars here are closer, and so they appear also at larger uh, latitudes. Uh, the stellar mass in the bar bulge that was estimated in this work uh, is, uh, is, is uh, significant uh, because they found, uh, uh, these authors found a mass of about uh, two, ti uh, two times 10 to the 10 solar masses for a total uh, stellar mass in the disk uh, that is estimated to be five, six times uh, um, to the 10 solar masses. Now, uh, because a boxy peanut bulge, as we learned from uh, end body models, is a thickened stellar bar, and a stellar bar forms out of this material, these findings uh, naturally imply that the Milky Way bulge is mostly made of stars that at some point have been taken where in the galactic disk and at some point were trapped into the bar and uh, in the, in the uh, boxy peanut instability. And so if I want to uh, schematically uh, summarize uh, uh, this set of work, uh, we have changed uh, our mind. And instead of thinking that most of the galactic bulge uh, is a classical bulge, uh, possibly merger driven, uh, what uh, we are seeing in the bulge is possibly, is mostly um, a system that has been a component uh, that has, uh, that has uh, uh, strong links uh, with the galactic disk. It is still possible that a small classical spheroid is in the bulge, and I will come back to this later. So uh, the, the, the relation between the bulge and the disk does not come only uh, from the morphology, uh, the boxy peanut shape morphology. There have been in the last decade a number of spectroscopic surveys as for example, Brava, Argos, uh, Gibbs, uh, Apogee, uh, that have really um, allowed uh, simulators and theoreticians to uh, test uh, the prediction of, uh, of, uh, of these models, and in particular of the disk origin of the Milky Way bulge, providing, in fact, robust evidence that the Milky Way bulge is mostly made of disk stellar populations. And there are uh, differences in the simulations, uh, in, the, in the way the initial conditions are, uh, uh, I mean, if they are not in a, in a cosmological context, but all the, 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 the common point of all these simulations, uh, some of which I will show later, is that to reproduce the properties of the Milky Way bulge, uh, the disk uh, from which uh, stars uh, uh, that formed the bulge uh, came uh, cannot be uh, only made of a unique, uh, let's say, uh, cannot be a unique kinematic component. It must be a, a disk where metal poor and metal rich populations coexist, where old stars and young stars coexist, 
And these metal poor and old stars and these metal rich and young stars must have different kinematics on average. So um, uh, essentially uh, the properties of, of, the, of the disk we need to reproduce the bulge properties are the properties that in fact we, we see in the galactic disk uh, in the form of the thin and the thin disk populations. So what kind of uh, models, uh, um, uh, what kind of um, uh, observational constraints this model have been able uh, uh, to reproduce so far? I will cite only a few. Um, one of these uh, is related to, for example, the study, the properties of the kinematics of stars in the bulge as a function of metallicity. What you see here on the right um, um, are, uh, is the kinematics of stars observed in the, in the, in the, in the bulge with the Argo survey. Uh, and the different columns correspond to stars with different, different metallicity beams. Uh, the top panel shows the rotation of the stars, uh, the line of sight velocities of, as a function of longitude for these stars at different latitudes, so a different height uh, above and below the plane. And the, uh, the bottom plot uh, show uh, the velocity dispersion of the stars. And what you see is that essentially, uh, rapidly speaking, uh, there is no significant difference if you look at the rotation of metal poor and metal rich populations in the bulge, at least for uh, stars with metallicities above minus one, while it is clear that there is a, a, a strong tendency in velocity dispersion. Huh? On average, the more metal rich stars tend to be colder than the uh, more uh, metal poor stars. And these trends have been, for example, reproduced uh, uh, in the simulations by Yatana Sula et al. 2017, and also others, where they show that, in fact, uh, if, uh, uh, if the galaxy, if the bulge formed out, formed out of, of a disk where the metal poor populations were also the kinematically hottest populations, it is possible to reproduce trends very similar to those uh, found in the, in the Argo survey. Uh, it's a matter of the link between uh, kinematics and metallicity, but it's also a matter of the overall uh, morphology uh, of the boxy peanut bulge, and in particular, uh, how this morphology depends or is traced by stars of different metallicities. Uh, the observational uh, um, uh, surveys uh, show indeed that uh, the, the, the boxy peanut shape um, is stronger uh, when it is traced uh, by the most metal rich stars in the bulge. That is, there is a tendency for most metal, for the stars that are more metal rich, to show also the stronger boxy peanut shape. And this is something that essentially all models that have looked at the relation between morphology and metallicities have been able to reproduce. Uh, the fraction of stars indeed that can respond to the backing instability and so that can participate to the boxy peanut formation uh, appears in all models to be higher in, uh, if, uh, in an initially coldest component than in an initially hotter one. Does, so again, if there exists a link between mentalistic and kinematics in the original disk, this will be mapped into some differences in the morphology uh, of the stellar populations in the bulge. Um, it's not only the, frac the, the shape of, uh, of metal poor and metal rich populations in the bulge that changes, but it's also the overall uh, fractional contribution of metal poor and metal rich stars in the bar region. And this is showed, for example, here in these, uh, in these bottom plots, where again you see results of another set of simulations that show you what you can expect in the case um, in a scenario where the bulge is uh, essentially made of disk population, cold and hot. And what, what you see here on the, on the bottom is the fractional density maps, that is the contribution of stars in different metallicity beams to, uh, to the bulge. And you see that essentially the metal, metal rich population is expected to uh, be um, significant uh, along at, at low latitudes. And then uh, there is a tendency for this metal rich population to decrease their contribution to the bulge as we move out uh, from the plane while the, 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 the contribution of the intermediate metallicity populations and of the metal poor ones is essentially the opposite. For example, if you look 
at the lower metallicity being here, you can see that uh, these um, metal poor populations are expected to have a, a limited contribution close to the midplane of the galaxy and of the bulge, while their contribution increases as we move out. So in some sense, the originally cold and hot disks are mapped differently in the bulge, and in particular, they retain a part of their uh, initial kinematics. So the, the originally hot disk will tend to be also the hottest population in the, in the bulge. So all this is important to why, because uh, if uh, um, the fractional contribution of metal rich and metal poor population is different, this naturally reflects uh, in, a, a in, a, in, a, um, in a different mean metallicity in the bulge regions and different metallicity distribution function. And again, here you can see a prediction of one of these models where you see um, uh, what we can expect in terms of longitude and latitude for stars in the bulge. Here you have the central regions of the bulge and here you have a part of the disk. And you see that one of the predictions is, for example, that the metal, that the central regions should be more metal poor than the surrounding disk. I uh, emphasize that here we have only disk populations. So this, uh, uh, this metal poor component that we see in the model doesn't come from a sphere world. It's simply related to uh, the, the characteristics of the metal poor populations that we have in our simulations. And, uh, and these uh, predictions are indeed uh, um, uh, very uh, similar to what other surveys, like for example, the Apogee surveys is providing. So you see the, that the trends are essentially the same, uh, a bulge that is on average more metal poor than the surrounding disk, sorry, as found in the models. Now, uh, so there have been, uh, I've cited only a few of the works that are trying to really go into the details, uh, to go beyond the, the simple morphology and try to uh, understand whether the, 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 all the, the relations that the observational community is providing about kinematics, metallicity, difference of populations in the bulge uh, can be reproduced uh, in this scenario uh, of uh, the, the bar back in its stability for uh, the origin of the Milky Way bulge. But there is another point that has been uh, for a long time um, uh, a puzzle and also um, a kind of limitation to this uh, um, scenario of uh, Milky Way bulge formation from disk population. And this problem has to do with the chemical enrichment of the bulge and of the disk. So this will be uh, addressed, uh, I think, tomorrow, possibly by Christina. But I just want to mention uh, briefly the point, because if we, want to, um, if we want to establish a relation between the bulge and the disk, in some sense, uh, we need, of course, to reproduce the bulge uh, properties starting from the disk properties. But we have also to show that uh, the chemical properties and the chemical abundances of the disk surrounding the bulge are similar to the one that we find in the bulge itself. And this for a long time has been a problem because essentially many works that were uh, uh, comparing the chemical abundances of stars, of giant stars in the bulge with the chemical abundances of stars at the solar vicinity were finding uh, significant differences. For example, in the level of alpha over iron enrichment as a function of metallicity. You can see this by comparing, for example, these red points that were stars in the bulge with the blue and the black points that correspond to stars at the solar vicinity, disk stars at the solar vicinity. And these differences were uh, um, essentially um, understood in terms of a different MF in the bulge and uh, a different uh, chemical enrichment, history of chemical enrichment. So uh, these results were pointing to a much faster chemical enrichment in the bulge relative to the disk. And this is another argument about uh, the, 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 the possibility that the bulge was indeed a sphere world, a classical bulge, and not, it didn't have much to do with the disk. However, this... Uh, um, these, uh, uh, these results have been revised. And uh, for example, there is uh, this review by Dimitri and Oscar Gonzalez of 
a few years ago where this point is rediscussed. And, uh, and uh, mm, it was in indeed understood that part of the difference between the bulge and, uh, and the uh, chemical abundances of the disk uh, was coming from a systematic bias uh, uh, that were present when comparing giants with uh, dwarf stars at the solar vicinity. So if we are able to compare, for example, dwarf stars in the disk with dwarf stars in the bulge, we see that the, the difference between uh, the, the, the chemical uh, um, abundance patterns of stars in the bulge and the chemical abundance patterns of stars in the disk is much reduced. And this is, for example, just one of these examples uh, from a couple of work by Thomas Besby on 2017 and 2021, where indeed uh, they show that uh, the, the, the abundant trends uh, that we see in the bulge for different elements as a function of a field of age are very similar uh, to the one that we find uh, that are found in the in the thick and uh, in the thin disk the inner, um, in the inner regions of the Milky Way. Now, um, as you see, uh, um, there is another point uh, that can um, that show that there is a, um, a, a similarity in the chemical enrichment and possibly in the star formation history of the bulge and the disk. And this point comes from, uh, uh, again, the, the chemical abundances and in particular the distribution of alpha over iron elements in the bulge. Uh, if you compare alpha over, the distribution of alpha over iron elements in the bulge with the same distribution in disk stars, and this is possible, for example, if you analyze the apogee data, you see that there is a dip in the distribution of alpha over iron element, elements at about 0, 0,1 uh, in alpha over iron. And uh, it is possible to interpret, you, you find this dip at the same uh, value, uh, both in the bulge and in the disk. And it is possible to interpret, in fact, this dip as a decrease in the star formation rate of the Milky Way. This is the blue thick line that is shown here, both for the bulge and for the disk, that should have occurred about 9 billion years ago. So uh, in some sense, it's possible, again, to relate the disk and the bulge also from the point of view of the star formation history of the galaxy uh, as a whole, uh, with the high alpha enhanced populations formed in a, in a first early phase of you know, high star formation, followed by a, a rapid decrease in the star formation that produced this dip, and then the star formation recovered to uh, lower levels and formed the low alpha population. Now, the fact that there can be stars uh, that have been formed in the bulge at different times uh, is another point that has, uh, um, uh, that has received and is still receiving much attention in the community. And why that? Because for a long time, we have seen the bulge as uh, a population that is uh, essentially homogeneously old. Um, and the main, uh, reason for the, the main reason for that uh, was related to the analysis of, uh, to the observed red colors of uh, turn off stars in the color magnitude diagrams. However, also this picture is changing and has been questioned in the last years, in particular, again, in the work by best being collaborators, because they could date, uh, age date stars in the bulge uh, by um, uh, by stars that were uh, dwarf stars that were uh, micro lens. And what they showed is that while it is true that all the metal poor populations in the bulge, the metal poor stars in the bulge are old, when we move to higher metallicities, we see that um, young stars can coexist with older stars. And this is uh, summarized, for example, in this plot on the right, uh, where the fraction of stars. Uh, younger than five, this is the blue curve or eight uh, red curve billion years, is shown as a function of metallicity. Again, while all essentially the metal um, uh, poor stars appear to be old, this is not the case where we go to high metallicity. So in particular, you can see that the dominant contribution uh, to, uh, to the metal-rich stars should come uh, accordingly to this result uh, by stars that are younger than 8 billion years. So why is that? How it is possible that uh, these young stars are found in the bulge? And again, models help 
as in understanding this picture. And this has been, for example, a point that has been addressed in two papers by Ness et al. in the Batista et al. 2014 and 2017, where they showed that, that again, in a scenario where the bulge form, uh, forms out of disk material, uh, the oldest populations, which are also kinematically hotter, tend to distribute mostly at high distances from the galactic plane, while close to the galactic plane, um, the bulge is expected to be on average uh, young, even if with a uh, large dispersion in age. So that means that we can find both young and old stars here. But on average, we expect a trend both with longitudes and with latitudes. Now, uh, I don't know how much time is left. I will try to, to go a bit more to the metal pool regime. Uh, Every few minutes, Paola, I've left. Okay. I will, I will uh, try to go uh, a bit to the metal pool regime um, because I think that here, here is where uh, possibly uh, some of the tensions or the questions still are. And by metal pool regime, uh, I mean essentially the stars be, uh, below minus one. So first of all, uh, the, the, the question, the problem of the metal pool regime is related to the problem of the existence of any classical bulge in the Milky Way bulge. As I was saying before, we have understood that most of the, of the bulge populations uh, possibly originated in, in disk populations with different kinematics, but we still have the question to understand whether there is a spheroidal component hidden in the bulge. And uh, uh, some models, uh, um, some simulations that then have been confirmed by others, but the first simulation showing that if a spheroidal component exists in the bulge, in the Milky Way bulge, must be small, uh, came from a paper, a work by Shen et al. in 2010. And what they did essentially was to analyze different simulations uh, uh, and comparing the kinematics of the bulge stars found in the simulations with uh, the data from the Brava survey. And you can see simply, for example, the, the, the plot here on the bottom right, where you see the blue points are the data and the different curves correspond to uh, uh, simulated galaxies with a different um, um, percentage of stars in a classical bulge. And you see, for example, the blue curve corresponds to a simulated galaxy where 30% of the stellar disk is in a classical bulge. And you see that the prediction are well above uh, the data. So the conclusion by Shen et al. were uh, that if a classical bulge exist in the Milky Way bulge, uh, it should not exceed 8% of the disk mass. Otherwise, it would not be possible anymore to reconcile the kinematics observed. So for a stellar disk of 5, 10 to the 10, this implies a mass of the classical bulge of at most 4, 10 to the 9 solar masses. Now, where, uh, um, so interestingly, um, this upper limit given, given by Shen is also consistent with, with, another, with a game that we could play. No? And it is, for example, take uh, the black hole mass uh, versus the spheroidal batch mass relation, as given, for example, by Corman Dieto, and ask ourselves for a black hole mass um, similar to the one that should be, uh, that is in the Milky Way, so uh, about four, 10 to the six solar masses. Which, is, uh, which would be the expected mass of the classical bulge. And we end up with values of a few 10 to the nine, so which are uh, very similar to the, to the predictions uh, to the upper limit given by Shen. Now, such a small uh, bulge, uh, classical bulge, uh, should have um, a mean metallicity if we adopt, for example, a mass metallicity relation at around minus one. So it should be in a regime where we, in fact, uh, current surveys up to a few years ago had very few stars. Uh, most of the stars that have been observed in surveys like Argos, for example, or Apogee, are uh, at metallicities above minus one. So we need to go uh, in a lower metallicity regime to try to find this ferroid if it exists. And here I want to mention this work by Erensen et al. Um, using the data from the pigs, uh, the Chris in their galaxy survey, where indeed they have started to do this work to go to the lower metallicity regime and to study, for example, the kinematics of stars in the bulge at metallicities below minus one. And what you see is that 
the, the, the kinematics of these metal pool stars that here are shown with the color points tend to be well above the kinematics uh, uh, derived for the more uh, metal rich population. So it's, uh, it's early to understand what's going on at these metallicities. It can be uh, that uh, we are entering a in the regime where we can start finding traces of a classical spheroid, but it's also possible that we have a mix of population. If we look at few KPC from the sun, most of these metal poor stars are indeed accreted. So it's possible that signs of accretions are also impacting these relations. But I think it's very interesting and it's possible one of the avenue to go to be able really to understand where the classical bulge is, if there is any. Paola, we should start wrapping up. I'm yes. afraid. So uh, my very last few slides are about the accretions, but maybe we, we can discuss this uh, later on in the, in, the, in the discussion section. And the fact that most of the Milky Way bulge appear to be in situ, and that the fraction of accreted stars seems to be only a few percent of the total mass. But personally, I have some, some questions that are also related to uh, very recent results that have been published about uh, simulations of Milky Way type galaxies. Um, and so maybe this is something that, uh, that we can rediscuss. And finally, uh, one last point is that uh, um, uh, these accreted, accreted stars that we find in the bulge um, and that are uh, being found associated to a, a satellite that has been called Heracles, have possibly also a counterpart in the global cluster systems in the, in the inner galaxy. And uh, what is uh, uh, usually referred to as Kraken, the Kraken satellite um, that has been proposed by Cruz and et al. studying the global cluster system of the Milky Way should be, in fact, the, the, the counterpart of what we see in, um, in, the, in, the, in the field stars. And so this, to me, opened the very last question that is, uh, uh, we, we have probably started to have a complete, uh, a quite consistent picture of, uh, of, the, of most of the, of the Milky Way bulge, at least a metallicity above minus one. It's still difficult to understand the, 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 the populations that make uh, the low metallicity part below minus one in the bulge. Um, we need um, uh, to add uh, to, to all these, to the fields, to the picture that we can derive from the field stars, also other tracers. I'm thinking about RR Lyre, and there is a, a, a talk by Andreas Kunder on that, but also the globular cluster systems, because we have many globular clusters in the central regions of the Milky Way, and they should have participated to, to, the, to the dynamical processes that I discussed before. And I leave you so with my conclusions, and sorry if I, did, if I took uh, some more time. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. We now have time for a couple of uh, questions. If you have any, please feel free to raise your hand and you will be unmuted to ask it or just write it in the Zoom chat or in the Slack channel. I'll give it. Okay, so there is one uh, from Francesca Fragudi. Thanks, Paola, for the very nice uh, review talk. So I I'm wondering, maybe you can say a little bit about what, how you think we can distinguish. So you, you mentioned in the um, very metal poor population below minus one, that we see um, some evidence for uh, these accreted uh, structures and these accreted satellites. So how can we distinct, can you say maybe something about whether you th we think or we know or we have any evidence of these being really distinct systems from maybe the, the chemistry or are these part of um, one system that appear as different clumps or can you say something about what we think the origin of, of these accreted well, structures are? I think, yeah, I think it's still difficult to say in the sense that if you look, sorry, I don't know why this moved, but it should be here, okay? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if you look at the, at the, at the chemical abundance of, uh, of these inner galaxy structures, 
called also Heracles uh, by Orten collaborators. What you see is that most of these stars are metal poor and are half enhanced. Uh, so in some sense, they seem a bit, uh, uh, many of them seem in continuation uh, from the chemical point of view uh, to what you would expect, for example, for, uh, for, the, for an early disk of the Milky Way. Uh, also, the kinematics, in some sense, can point, uh, does not necessarily indicate that all these stars are accreted because they are in a region where you also have the inner disk that can puff up. Uh, so how to do? I think that, uh, um, well, first of all, we need the statistics because if we want to see whether there are several populations in these regions and we need to separate things. So uh, we need to, to have uh, statistics as large as possible in terms of the number of stars. And then I think that the way to go is to keep comparing with the disk and the halo. That is to, to keep looking, making a comparison between the properties that we see for these metal poor stars in the bulge with the properties that we see in the halo and see how many of these stars can be related to uh, accretion events that we have identified in the halo outside the bulge and how many are, for example, related to the metal poor tail of the disk that we have also identified outside the bulge. And the other point for me are globular clusters, because uh, here you have uh, uh, many uh, metal poor globular clusters in the bulge regions. And this is another way to eventually help understanding uh, the differences, the in situ and the accreted populations. Thanks. The next question is from Patricia. Patricia, you're muted. Sorry, yeah, no, I mean, no, no, yes. Yeah, they say that the, the host didn't allow me to unmute, so yeah, someone fixed up, apparently. Thank you very much for the talk, Paula. Um, my, my question is, uh, what is the, the metallicity distribution of the stars in the bulge and in the thick disk? Is similar or? Similar modulo, uh, the, I mean, um, the metallicity distribution changes depending where you look at in the bulge, no? So the metallicity distribution changes with longitude and latitude. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what you see is that uh, the, the, what we, we call usually the intermediate metallicity, the, the intermediate component. That I mean, I'm meaning the alpha, the alpha, the, alpha, the, alpha, the, alpha, the high alpha, the um, from, because I, I mean, I, Assume that the, the ones that have uh, high metallicity are the thin leaves, no? That form later somehow. Yes. But for the for the high alpha beta phi, I wonder if uh, if the distribution of metallicity yeah is the same for the stars in the thick leaves and in in the bulge. So they, they are, come from the same population. Okay. They they I mean models show that they are modulo the mapping of okay. the disk in the bulge that is that okay. if you take uh, um, if you take uh, for example uh, a significant fraction of, uh, of a thick disk stars and you map it into the bulge depending on where you look at this fraction will change and so uh, if you if you but the models are able to to show that the way this mdf changes with longitude and latitude is consistent with a scenario where you have simply a thin and a thick disk mapped into the bulge okay and someone well, did you have any idea of what could uh, just stop the star formation in, in in the galaxy i mean the the star formation rate was, i mean the, the black hole should be very very massive no and the uh, I don't know if there is I think yeah. I think there are several uh, I mean I don't have uh, an answer I think that it happens at a time uh, where uh, um, several processes can end or start no so it's possibly it's related to the end of the most significant uh, possibly mergers in the Milky Way and uh, and this uh, for example the time of the accretion of Gaia Sosa Genceladus is uh, mm, is uh, mm -hmm. between yeah. 8 and okay. 10 billion years let's say around okay. 9 so it's possibly the end of this. Uh, with Sergei Koperskov a few years ago, we suggested that it, it could have been possibly also associated to the formation of the bar, uh, which could have uh, um, decreased the star formation in the inner regions. So it's, it's difficult to say, and these things can be related in the sense that you can expect mm -hmm. that the bar starts forming when the most violent phase of, of mm -hmm. accretion events ends. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good, and then one last question from Michael.
sorry. I just wanted to point out there's an interesting talk uh, by Tommaso Marchetti in which we show that there are very few stars uh, younger than two gay years in the bulb based on uh, using Gaia to veto uh, foreground disk stars. But also, uh, Meredith Joyce has been leading an interesting project uh, in which she has uh, reassessed the isochrone ages of the Bensby sample using the missed isochrones with the alpha enhancement supplied. And she's finding that while the metal core stars are young, they're in the eight to 10 giga year range rather than in the extremely young, you know, like younger than five giga year range. And so I, I would say that th th these extremely young stars may not actually be present in the bulge. Uh, but I do think that you know that that there continues in our studies there continues to be evidence that the metal rich stars are younger than the metal poor stars yeah. and then around the eight to ten g year range yeah indeed it would be very interesting to you know to 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 really uh, get to arrive to some conclusions also for that because it means if there is an age metallicity relation because this is also what what, what you're suggesting it's interesting to to understand to what extent this is similar to the age metallicity relation that we know uh, for disk stars. This will be another uh, no, way to, to, to probe uh, the, the, uh, the similarity uh, in the origin of these populations. Further, our uh, BDBS study uh, shows that the most metal rich stars, and this agrees with many studies, are very concentrated to the plane uh, with an increasing <laughs> concentration of high metallicity. Yeah. Uh, these are red clump stars. So yes, there really may not just be an age metallicity relationship, but also an age metallicity spatial distribution relationship. Yeah, yeah, that for sure. Yeah, yeah. This for for sure. Uh, you, you you have, uh, as I was showing, that uh, all the simulations by Benes, by the Batista, the one we ran at Anasola, they all suggest that the 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 the, the mean metallicity and the mean age. Uh, changes depending on where we look at in the bulge. So it's necessary also to try to map different regions to see uh, where these uh, metal rich and, uh, and the younger stars are. Thank you. I'm afraid we need to stop this session here. So the recordings will be put online on the Bulges 2022 website in the area for the registered participants. I would like to thank both Simon and Paula for their very nice talks and remind all of you that the next session will start at 7 p.m. Uh, Central European time. So see you later. Thank you all.